Good afternoon. I'm Vicki Wesling with City Speaks. City Speaks is a show that is a vision of Mayor Rosas. It's here for the residents, for the city of Dunkirk. It's here to let you know what's happening in our world, in our area. It's letting you know what's going on in our administration and giving you some background. Also, we bring information that hopefully will be helpful to you as residents. So with that, our guests today are Mike Vinciguerra and Mike Tremuda. So, guys, welcome. And Mike Thank and you. Mike are here. That in, sounds like a radio show. In the morning. In the morning. In the afternoon. <laughs> and I want to thank you for the introduction. Well, well, you're welcome. We're so pleased to have you. It's, it's really great that sometimes we get to have a resident who can come in, who can share their stories. And we want to talk a little bit today about what's happening here in the city of Dunkirk. We have situations that are going on uh, with our, you know, certainly drugs, uh, the opioid epidemic is everywhere and um, just to let you know and let the residents know that the mayor has absolutely not given up on bringing a methadone clinic to the city of Dunkirk. It is needed. It is at the top of his priority list. He is in contact on a regular daily basis uh, with the principals involved and we will have a methadone clinic here in Dunkirk to help our people who need it. And Mike, tell me, go ahead. I, I second that, and in the beginning, being a counselor, I kind of stayed out of it, and then I saw what was going on where, where people were half-truths, no truths at all about, you know, uh, fear, the whole thing. So, and I agree with you, um, we're going to get a clinic, and Mike can testify to this, that, uh, you know, uh, he'll tell you his story, that if there were a clinic here, uh, possibly Jacqueline might, might still be here, because you and I talked about that. And so basically, yeah, um, that's one of the top priorities right now for right. me. And, it, and it's not just a matter of, well, I don't want it here or I don't want it there. The fact of the matter is we need this. We need this clinic. The thing is programs like this, Vic, will um, eliminate some of the fear, don't you think, Mike, that people have because they just don't know. You know, we, we've been through this. I mean, I've been doing this 35 years. These are people that are sick. They're not bad people. Um, and basically our job is to try to get them better. Right. And uh, making people go back and forth to Buffalo to get methadone to me is absurd. Right. I mean, if it was my child, I'd uh, probably file a lawsuit. I mean, it's crazy. Right. So we, we, that clinic needs to be here. It, it does, and you, you speak of fear, and all fear is is false expectations appearing real. Yep. That's all fear is, and they think, well, if there's a clinic here, it's just gonna bring up all the, the derelicts and the homeless and the bums and that's not the way it is. Many of these people who are homeless and bums are because they're using and if they had a clinic to go to life would be different. That's only four percent of all the people that are sick are in that category. The other 96 percent are superintendents, their counselors, their presidents, vice presidents, you know and so basically when people realize in their own family they can see it but they deny that it's there our job is to bring it out and say, look, it, it would be unbelievable to set up a methadone clinic and then stick drug dealers outside selling drugs. Right. I mean, that's really <laughs> irrational. And that's what the, and that's nothing against the people. But remember, Mike, the people that were with the school were bringing that. We don't want our kids around those kind of people. Well, a lot of those kids are around kind of those kind of people in your own families. Right. They, and they don't realize it. You know. and, they, and they don't even know it. Yeah. Well, one thing I can say as a parent from a deceased child that I lived through it, I picked it up late. You know, I didn't see all the warning things early enough. And I, and because I'm by just like every other parent, can't happen to me. Well, let me tell you something. As soon as you say that, you're in trouble as far as I'm concerned because then you're not really paying attention. And one of the things I can say to you that I was afraid to do things at times to, to uh, discipline my daughter because I thought I was going to lose her. And because of that fear, I ended up losing her big time. She died. Mm -hmm. I can say one thing about a methadone clinic is I don't know if, let's say that, I don't know if that's the complete answer, but you've got to start someplace. And people that go there know they, that they have to do something. My daughter traveled back and forth to uh, Buffalo 
for years, and in that traveling, because of the weather and everything, we lost two vehicles mm. because of the traveling. And the, the thing is, if they got to go any distance, any local people have to go any distance, that's their whole life. That's their job. Mm -hmm. They end up going there, they get their stuff, they're on a bus, the bus don't run every five minutes, so they got to wait to come back. That's their whole day shot. Mm -hmm. They can't be productive. Let me ask you this, Mike, uh, when you and I were talking about it. What are some of the pitfalls when you tried to get Jacqueline into treatment? <clears throat> some of the pitfalls were when I approached, and both in the state and out of the state, was they, <clears throat> they wouldn't get her in right away unless she had went to a, like a stepping stone place first mm -hmm. where they would say, okay, yeah, you really need it. Now we can get you into the big place. It's like a semi-halfway house. Right, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and that's was the things we were always up against. And also the other thing, to be honest with you, is cost. You know, you're, and I, that sounds like I'm selfish because I would have gave anything for her, but you're dealing with insurance companies and they want all these things before they'll even pay one penny. Mm. Right. So, it, it, you person out here, in my opinion, that doesn't understand the whole program, which I didn't, mm -hmm. is, at a, is at a handicap to help your kid. You and know, there's laws that, help, that don't help your kid either because of it, their ages. Well, there's no doubt that uh, the amount of courage that it takes to come on a program like this mm -hmm. and share something with people out there, if right. if you get one person that's going to call you, it's just like uh, John the, from the paper said, if we get one person, we can help. If you get one person through your program, um, then the, um, the fear and all the things that it takes to come on a program like this is worth it because um, the idea is when uh, good men do nothing and evil triumphs and it stays. Our right. job is to upset the apple cart, and that's what we're trying to Absolutely. do. Absolutely, and you you know, the thing about it is, is to get the message out to the parents, to the people, to say, you know, you mentioned some of the signs, some of the things that you missed. What are some of those? Can you can you kind of tell me well, a little bit, what are the signs that the parents should Some of the things I know, let's say that uh, things start showing up missing in my house, and I never thought too much about it. Okay, maybe, you, who knows, you misplaced it, whatever. What they were, what she was doing was taking things and selling them for her drugs, you know? And I, I didn't see that because one of the things, I think I'm like a lot of parents, is you got a job and you're out there working all the time you can to help support your family, give them the best you can. I look back at it, maybe I should have worked less. Well, you know, that's... I, I, I should have worked less because I worked a lot of hours. Yeah. And, and spent more time observing and learning in my own house. And I didn't do that. Well, I, I, well don't you think, though, in all fairness, that sometimes as parents, we don't want to see it. We don't want to believe that our child might be doing these mm -hmm. things. Well, I think that's, I think you're, uh, you're, you're right. I mean, because a lot of parents say they'll come out and they'll, oh, not my kid. My kid would never do that. And, and I don't know if that's a, a crutch for them to not to really want to see it or not, but they, they believe that their kid is, is a good kid. Tell, tell and, and that doesn't make them a bad kid because they're doing drugs. Don't right. get me wrong. They, they want to believe the best of their, of their child, and I did that. And to be honest with you, I didn't really get to really notice the whole thing until later in her life. And her and I had later, it's we talked a little bit and uh, she had told me she had started this when she was 14 years old. 14. Now what, she, did, what did she get started with? Do you know what drug? I do not have, I do not know that. We never really talked about what one, she, but she said she started when she was 14. Mm. And that, and that was in the, probably in the last two or three years of her life where she started talking to me about that. Meanwhile, I knew she was going to the, the methadone clinic. I seen the traveling time. I seen the, what was going on there. And I went to those clinics. And for and at the ones I were, was at, I didn't see any of these needles around 
or someone outside pushing because most of the people there were trying to get help. Right. I don't know if they're going to get cured, but they were trying to get help. Right. And it was a stepping stone. I saw very professional people, because we go to that clinic early in the morning, come in there, get what they needed, and off to work. Mm. And if you're traveling, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. right. Especially if you're dependent on a bus. How can you do it? The bus sure. leaves here, say, yeah. it's 6 in the morning, and you go all the way to Buffalo, and they got to wait for everybody until whatever time to come back. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, just, you just can't do it. You can't be a productive person. And you speak of the clinics, the <clears throat> methadone clinic that uh, the mayor is looking at that we really want to bring to the city of Dunkirk. The principals who run that clinic, who own that clinic, I mean, it is immaculate. It is well organized. Mm -hmm. It's total, totally professional. There's security. I mean, it is not like you're, you, you feel like you're walking into a nice upscale uh, medical facility, which is exactly what it is. It's not anything that people have this vision in their minds, this little back alley place. It the, isn't that way. The halfway houses and the outpatient clinics and the halfway houses like uh, uh, Gino runs police themselves. Be, be, you know, we once in a while we may have, I don't, in Cass Manor in four years, I don't think we ever, I know the police came to the door and looking for people and we never, of course, would confirm or deny they were there because of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. But no, you're right. Uh, they they police themselves. They they, right. they take care of it the way it should be. The way that Mike it should said. be. So now, when when uh, now, what was your daughter's name? Jacqueline. Jacqueline. So she started at 14. 14, she told 14. me. 14. How long did she go? How what? How old was she when she finally passed? 25. 25. So it took all of, yeah. you know, 11, yeah, 11 years, years. 11 years. 11 years from the time she started. Yeah. And so she so she started at 14 and she graduated through. Tell me, you know, when all this happened as a parent, you know, you, you had to just be devastated. Well, I was, well, I was hurt a lot, you know, and, uh, and trying to reach out, and uh, both my wife and me. It wasn't just me, you know, mm -hmm. trying to reach out and, and see what can be done, you know. It put a lot of pressure on the whole family, which I think caused a little discomfort in the whole family. Sure. But and one thing I did learn about she one of the words and I got to get a little bit into me a little bit. That's okay. One of the w words she always used to use Leah, I don't care, I don't care. And I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean you don't care? These things are important, you know? They should be important to you. Well, what happened to me is I ended up having a uh, back operation which uh, turned out to be pretty uh, tough. I had to learn how to walk again and everything. They had me on so many legal drugs that I didn't really even half the time know my name and I was using the exact same word she was. I don't care mm. because the only thing I was caring about was getting the next dosage of drugs mm -hmm. to help relieve that pain. And anybody and, that's ever been there knows how quick you can get addicted to oxys and well, yeah. hydros and vikes and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, when, they, when people do it, and, and, and you asked Mike a question about how do you know. Kids are going to use, they're going to experiment, most of them aren't going to get sick. The ones that do, and Mike went through this, and Mike has been a stalwart for helping others uh, with their addiction, with kids with addiction and fighting for the clinic. Um, then that's a whole different ball game, and that's what we hope that the viewers will understand that we're talking about addiction here. We're not talking about something you can just oh stop doing it and you know you can look at what you got in front of you. No, because the major uh, thought of anyone when they get addicted is that drug. It supersedes marriage. It supersedes work. It supersedes sex. The only thing they're worried about is getting their next high, getting their next fix. And that's hard for people to understand, Vic. You know? yeah. Well, I'm, I'm got, sure. And that's, and that's, he's correct. And the other thing is, too, is uh, Mike and I talked about it, and he, and he said one parent had mentioned, well, I never no noticed that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I understand where that person's coming from because I, I didn't notice that. And what, the, what the, uh, the, the, my daughter was doing, I looked at her as, that, well, that's part of the teenager growing up. Right. Yeah, you know, well, and you not, not being a professional 
at anything, you know, in that field. And never, and I got to say, like you mentioned before this started, I never, ever took an illegal drug. Yeah. Not even, I never even puffed on a, on a marijuana thing. I had a lot of friends around me that were doing it, mm -hmm. but I never did it myself. Yeah. And don't ask me why. I could have been one of them, but I never did. And when they had me on these things, which they had me on oxys, hydros, they had me on Valium, they had me on uh, Dilaudid, I can't even name, name it all. I'm, I'm sitting up in Erie, Pennsylvania, trying to uh, walk again, because that's how bad the operation was. And one day I was sitting there, and I, I don't know what made me, my head come with thing. I said, something ain't right here. And I started getting myself off them. And I had two nurses there that had gone through stuff, and they started helping me. And I'll tell you something, I was so disappointed in the medical field because I was working myself <laughs> off. Mm -hmm. And the day I was leaving that place, the doctor that was the head of it comes in, he says, oh, he says, you know why, you, I see you've been taking yourself off these oxys and this stuff here. He said, it must be because of the, the I upped the dosage on this other drug. <laughs> I looked at my daughter there, I says, okay. Thank you. And I asked him, I said, how long am I going to be on that? Oh, that, you'll be on that the rest of your life. Oh, okay. So anyways, they give me a stack of prescriptions. I might exaggerate the stack because it might only have been like that. But anyway, <laughs> a bunch of them. But I'm, I'm saying, to, and my daughter's sitting right there, and he says, you're going to have to get these filled in Pennsylvania before you go back to New York because of the laws and everything. So then you go back to your regular GP, and he can redo them. So we get out of the place, I get in the car, and my daughter says, we're gonna stop in Northeast to fill them? I looked right at her, I said, we're going cold turkey. <laughs> this is the end of it. And Tom McTernan was my GP at that time, great guy, love him. I told, I, I called him up, I talked to him a little bit, and he says, you're going cold turkey. And then people up there were saying, well, you do that, you might have a stroke, and you might have that BS. I did not want to live in that world. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, but that's that's been and so during that times when Jacqueline died too. Oh, during I was going through that. She died during that time, and Tom told me he says they got you on so many drugs, and the people that were coming to my house didn't think I was going to make it. He said that's what killed your daughter. Hmm. What, oh. what what I was going through. So. Oh gosh. But I'm, but I also like Mike said though, just to change, go back to a little bit, the security at these places at these methadone places is very high. Yeah, they it, got great security. And is, they don't put up with any BS. If, mm -hmm. if there's something going on in there where people want, want to get in a scuffle and match, they're out. Right. They don't want to it deal is, with them it's, people. It's, the methadone clinic is really something that we not only do that we need, but we need to get the message out to the residents. You know, there's nothing to fear about having a methadone clinic in the city of Dunkirk. Can, can I jump in? Sure. We're going to give them methadone, but one thing that they can't get in Buffalo when they go back and forth is the treatment section of the day where we work on treatment issues, anger and rage, shame and guilt, anxiety, depression, fear. They are going to get treatment also for multitudes of things where you go get your methadone, you come back, I don't know if they get treatment. I guess they do. Some don't. Yeah. Some don't show up for weeks. Yeah. You know, th th this is going to be a prerequisite of them getting their methadone. Is you got to earn the methadone too. Right. And so the emotional support yes. is, is what you're talking about. The counseling, the emotional support, and that's critical for any kind of recovery. Whether, right. You know. So so you we need that. So now you're going through all of these things with all of these drugs, all of this stuff going through your system. Jacqueline now is seeing you. And did you know at that time while you're going through this that she was going through her own situation? During that, I'm going to try to re reflect back during that time. I don't know if she really noticed that because what had happened also during that time, she went to a clinic in California. And what r really went on there, I do not know because I was fighting my own stuff at that time. I know when she came back, it wasn't long after that she passed. So I don't know what really yeah. went out, went on there. 
I noticed, I know they called me and asked me to, to pay the bill. Yeah. <laughs> right, they always want yeah. their money. So now, when she, was she was she living at home when she? No. And she over, did she overdose? She overdosed. She overdosed. No, she wasn't living at home. She was staying with another person at that time when she uh, overdosed. Oh, and I didn't pursue th that person to really get any real answers okay. for multiple t reasons, maybe my rage, yeah. but I did not do that. Yeah. Well, you know, and you mentioned that the whole, that during this time, you know, you should go through the teenage years and you think this is just being a rebellious teenager, this is just what they do. And you talk about how it affected your whole family. And that's what happens. D drug addiction is not just, it doesn't happen just to one person. It's a family illness. Oh, it's yeah. a family illness, and you have to cope with that. And so you and your wife and, right. you know, it, it... More often than not with parents, and Mike t maybe testified to this, if it's a son or a daughter, parents, mom and dad become addicted to the son or the daughter to get them better. You know, I don't know if you thought of it that way, but I know when I do family therapy, um, the parents are so uh, engrossed of uh, uh, getting uh, getting them to stop, getting them better, focusing around, and they forget how to take care of themselves. And that's an issue because a lot of times they figure, well, if we help him or her get better, then everything will get better. And they've gotten just as sick mm -hmm. as their son or daughter or husband or wife. Yeah. And, and we talk about some of the triggers, some of the, some of the things that that as parents we need to notice, you talked about things missing. You know, suddenly things are missing, things are not there. We talk about uh, they're withdrawn, they spend too much time in their room, or they don't talk. How are you doing? Oh, I'm okay, and they go, go on about their way. They're all what, of them. What, what, what other it. kinds of, of things should, should or, parents look for? What do we need to know about? Well, I see her come along and say, hey, what's, what's going on here today? She says, oh, I'm tired. You're tired? I mean, all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm tired. Okay, and you and you wonder, you know. Right. And not knowing, you know, it, I don't think parents really. And I'm talking about myself. Maybe there's a lot smarter people out there than me. See the real problem there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they say they're tired. Okay. All right, you're tired, you know, rather than dig into why you're tired. Mm -hmm. Or things are not where they're supposed to be, rather than digging into uh, why that's, they're not where they're supposed to be. And I can say from my point of view, maybe I didn't want to really pursue it and really get hardcore about it, because like I mentioned earlier, I thought I'd lose my daughter. Mm -hmm. She'd just right. take off and run. You yeah, know? If you put too yeah. much pressure on yeah. her. So, you know, and mm -hmm. in the end, by not doing that and not pursuing it, I paid the ultimate price. Mm -hmm. I lost her. In answer to your question, just to give the viewers something quick, um, if, say, uh, high school, um, sophomores, juniors, seniors, um, they're good student, dropping grades. Uh, friends, change of friends. Uh, they say you're only as sick as your secrets. Secrecy. Um, late hours. Uh, lying. Uh, stealing uh, uh, mom's rings. Uh, uh, using the car without any responsibility. Uh, basically uh, blaming others for their behavior. If you get a bunch of things like this, viewers, and you have concerns about your child, um, then you should pursue it. Wouldn't you agree, Mike? Go yeah. after it. Well, one of the things I'm going to say that, that, that uh, the failure, I think, in part of the system or, or uh, the treatment is they got it, in my opinion, when they're in that treatment, because I seen her come out and she look, just looked like a, doing great, you know? Mm -hmm. But what she did, she kept on going back to her same friends. Yep. And when you start going back to the same friends that are users, guess what? The next day, you're using. Yeah. So, and she went through three times to, to rehab. But every time she came back, she went back to the same friends. Mm -hmm. And I say one thing, I think cell phones are one of the most dangerous things out there. 
because they can keep track of every dealer, every oh, sure. user, yeah. every doctor. Because one thing is, when you get on methadone, if you go to a certain doctor's, they prescribe benzos to you. They take the benzos along with that methadone, they got the same high. Mm -hmm. And one thing I noticed by going to some of these places and bringing her to these doctors, they don't seem to sit in one place too long. Their offices yeah. seem to change. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here, you yeah. know? Being yeah. stupid, you know? Well, maybe he's getting a better office. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you bring well, up, don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really. Honestly, you, you bring up a key point, and I talk to I, Gino. I, I, I just see that stuff. I look back later. I'm thinking, why? What's going on here? You know. So, I, th I talked to Gino about this. The, the, of getting in to the upper levels of the schools, because your sophomores, juniors, and seniors, these this is where the parties are occurring. Mm -hmm. This is where kids are getting sick, and to never have a referral to a place like Alba de Vida, if or when our clinic comes here, tells me that, and we're not here to blame anybody, but we're here to say, you know, it's highly irrational that there's a lot of sick kids out there that people are letting them remain sick mm -hmm. when they could be getting um, admissions, they, they could be getting um, basically uh, programs uh, that would help them. I remember one year I helped the Lancaster football team uh, he found out that I was, uh, you know, basketball coach, and I was coaching at UB, and I had a drug and alcohol background, and I worked with his whole football team, and we had five kids that were in trouble. Mike, got him treatment. Otherwise, you know, they would have been kicked off the team, and they were, and they were allowed, you know, that if you ring laps, you're go you're going to miss a game. If you ring laps again, you're going to miss three games, mm -hmm. and there were rules and standards set up to help them get through the year and to get better. So one of the things I think we have to do too is, is uh, get out into the schools too and spread the message. Well, we need to do that, and we need to we need to put our residents here, the city of Dunkirk, on notice that there is a drug problem here in the city of Dunkirk. Yes. We are not unique; it's all over the world and all over the country. But we, we need to do something here and now. And and I tell you, the the really work to make things work takes the whole community. Because I just was watching TV the other day, and they talked about Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio was losing 80 people a month mm -hmm. on drugs. Mm -hmm. And they finally got together, both as the community, the police, everybody started working. Those numbers have dropped because of everybody working together. And that takes everybody. Right. I and don't one, care who it is. In one year in Ohio, there were 37,000 overdose deaths. You know, and here in Dunkirk, we have our drug force uh, task force. Our police chief, uh, David Ortolano, is very involved in that. Great we guy. read about it. We know things are, all, are happening. The mayor is very in tune to what's going on. He's, I mean, this is really at the top of his priority list. We're so sorry for your loss of Jacqueline. Okay. Thank you. you know, the, and, the, the mayor has put himself out there. He's never given it up, and this is why we're on board with him. Right. We want to see this clinic come to Dunkirk, New York, because it's going to be very beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Thank You're welcome. And thank you. thank you, residents. Please, please, please uh, let us know what you think. Give us a call. You can watch us on Spectrum 1301. Yeah. Like us on Facebook. Go to Twitter. You may uh, call me directly at City Hall, 363-6888. Uh, email me at vwesling at cityofdunkirk.com. Send a letter, snail mail, to City Hall, 342 Central Avenue, Dunkirk. We'll get back with you. Let us know what you think. And just, you know, let's hope that this happens. We know it's going to. Let's hope it happens sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Definitely. And thank you, Mike. Yeah, take, take care. care. Yeah, yeah. Take, take care. care. Thank, thank you, Mike. You, take care.